Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. All glory to Jesus. Man that rip the balabra no shan that rip the bahai. On that rip the venosh the bahan the bagabazon the rub the boshande. Lord, we bless you. We honor you. We glorify you once again this morning. Thank you, Lord Father, for your eternal principles, your eternal words that never fail. We bless you, Lord. We come before you once again with our heart open unto you. We rejoice in you. We celebrate you. You are worthy of glory. You are worthy of honor. Hallelujah. Friends, wherever you are this morning, once again, I welcome you to the Potter's Gate online broadcast. Just a quick one this morning that uh, we are going to look into. We are in the School of Christ, amen, in the School of Prayer with Christ. This is uh, what we will be at least looking into for a while. I don't know for how long, but um, our prayer morning session, you know, is being tagged in the School of Prayer with Christ. And the reason for that is we are told that the disciples of Jesus, they say, Lord, teach us how to pray. As we have said, prayer is beyond just having a communication, is beyond just having a conversation. There's a lot more to prayer, <clears throat> excuse me, that we are seeking to understand why, because prayer by nature is spiritual. And if, and if anything, amen, is spiritual, we need to learn. And the best teacher to teach us about the things of the Spirit, of course, is Christ. There's a lot of ideas, ideologies, belief system, and all kinds of, you know, uh, uh, trainings that people have acquired that is satanic, is demonic, is false. You know, when you ask people, they will tell you what they know about prayer. They will, in fact, they will tell you what prayer is to them and what, you know, the power of prayer as acquired for them but we seek not to pursue amen strange teachings demonic teachings teachings that are contrary to the principles of the word of god and of course the balance of god's word so even even though something is from the word does not make it correct you have to have the right balance principle you have to have the right sense of understanding you have to have amen a 360 degrees you know value system and concept to that thing so the fact that somebody picks something from the Bible does not make it correct we can pick things and use those things all right to facilitate or to emphasize or even to reinforce our own ideas and beliefs people will tell you but it's in the Bible It's in the Bible <laughs> so we don't do that yet we look at amen the whole counsel of God's Word and we build on that. And I believe that if you have been following what we have been dealing with, what we've been talking about, these things must have been building and helping you. All right. So we will continue again this morning. We're going to be dealing with the session four. In fact, let me just quickly correct, you know, a, a, a mistake. When we began the school of our, our, our prayer, I remember starting from what I call, you know, part 10. And that was because we have done certain teachings on prayer along that line for a while so i thought i could just continue but i felt a conviction that i should not do that so i, I i'm starting basically afresh looking at prayer from the very first day we started a few days ago you know part one part two or session one session two so today will be session four of course if you go back to our teachings you know in the past five six seven years you would have realized that we've done a lot of teaching on prayer yes we've got close to 500 700 materials just on prayers that we have done so uh yeah but this we want to target if you will in the school of prayer with christ and hopefully we don't know what is going to come out of it maybe a book you know but this is a resource I, i'm i'm hoping that will continue to you know strengthen you empower you all right so we will deal with prayer we will deal with other aspects and all of this is within the context of you know what the lord spoke to us or what the lord is speaking to us about in relating to occupying till christ amen returns 
if we're going to occupy and occupy very well, we have to know how to occupy also in the place of prayer. We have to know how to occupy in the place of intercession. We have to know how to occupy in the area amen, of our finance, our, you know, economy. We have to know how to occupy in the areas of our home, our marriage, our family. We have to know how to occupy our space in the areas of the life of our children, amen, their development. So this is an holistic teaching. We have to know how to occupy in the area of our relationship with our friends, neighbors, community, you know, colleagues. We have to know how to occupy, amen, within the areas of our health, amen, within the areas of, you know, our, you know, uh, life everything that you know life is and life offers to us we must find how to occupy in this area so you can see that this is a teaching that's why i said we don't know for how long this concept of you know occupying till christ return because that's the word all right we've been given resource the bible says you know a rich man or a noble man was going to possess you know a a a, a a place for himself in a far country and when he was going he left talent for his his you know his his, his uh, uh, employees all right he called them he said look i'm giving you guys 10 talents there were 10 of them so he gave them talents according to their measure according to their capacity according to you know their sense of you know uh, uh, um, you know mission he gave them he said do business till i come Right? And we see that as a, you know, as as you know, as a parable that God has you know given to us as the church, right? To occupy, to do business. If you're going to do business, you have to transact. You have to get yourself involved. You have to get your hands dirty. All right, you've got to you've got to be on ground. Amen. All hands must be on deck. You understand? It's not something that you do. You know, uh, uh, disconnecting yourself. You can't disconnect yourself and and occupy. It means that if you don't occupy something else or someone else, amen, it's going to occupy that space. And we know, amen, that there are areas, all right, that the enemy have sought to occupy. The Bible says, while men were sleeping. So one area we're dealing with, amen, in this concept of, you know, uh, 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 occupying till Jesus return, all right, is in the place of prayer. How do we occupy our space in the place of prayer? If we're going to be effective, amen, in our you know, in our walk with God, in our mission on earth, amen, we have to occupy the three realms of life. We have to occupy the spiritual realm, amen. We have to occupy, amen, yes, you know, the, 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 the physical realm, amen. And then we have to occupy the realms, amen, of, you know, relationship. We have to occupy the realm of the spirit. We have to occupy the realm of the soul. We have to occupy the realm, amen, yes, of, you know, human interaction, you understand we cannot live life successfully no matter how powerful you 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 are or you think you are if those areas amen are not clear to you particularly the the areas or the realm of soul remember we're dealing with amen issues that deals with strong goals strong belief system we're dealing with ideologies. That's what the Bible says. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness, against spiritual wickedness. You see how these three con connect, all right? The areas of spiritual warfare to the way people think, all right, and to the way people act. They are all interconnected. So we want to be fully armed all around. We want to be complete. We don't want one area of our life, yes, reflecting success. And then we look on the other side. We are being defeated. We want to be fully armed. We want, amen, our garrison, amen, to be well built. We want to build, amen, yes, you know, a, 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 a well-informed, a well-built, amen, you, you understand, you know, garrison. That every area of our life, amen, we can, we have a 360 degree sight of what's going on, amen. We, 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 we're not fooling ourselves and say, well, 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 we're safe, we're occupied. Meanwhile, the enemy is coming in from the air or is coming in from the ground or is coming in, amen, from the water side dimension that we are not aware of. So we want to be able to be, you know, uh, uh, informed and equipped, amen, and prepared. All right yes we don't want to sleep in any area of our life i don't want you to sleep in the areas of your finance all right i want you to be well amen prudent in that area you you want you must understand how to do business so regardless of what is coming up amen regardless of what is going to be happening in the next 10 years or you know in 2030 
All right. No matter what's going on, we have to be ready. And we can only do that if we learn to walk with God. If we learn to, amen, obey His command. We learn to live our life in congruence, amen, in unity, in harmony, amen. He said to Abraham, walk with me. So we are finding values and principles in the Word of God that will allow us to become effective stewards. Come on. I want you to say that I will be an effective steward. I will be committed to the ways of God. I'm asking you to repeat that after me. I will be obedient to the principles of God. I will not be slack. I will not be in discipline. I will live my life in alignment with the will of God. Everything that I do, I will do them because I've obeyed. I've listened to God and I'm obeying him. I will not allow the enemy to sneak into my life. I will not look at things on the face value. But I will see and I will discern. I will understand and I will walk in accordance to the leading of the spirit. I'm a spirit man. I have a spirit being. I'm a spirit being. I live my life in unity and in unison to the spirit. I let the Holy Spirit lead me. I let the Holy Spirit guide me. I obey and I follow. My life is a reflection of obedience. I will walk in truth. I will not live my life in falsehood. All that I do will prosper because Christ is in me. All that I lay my hands will prosper because I do them in obedience to his will. I declare that today my life is in submission to the ways of God. No sickness, disease or infirmity will befall me. I declare in the name of Jesus that I will speak forth as the oracle of God. I am blessed going out. I am blessed coming in. Blessed is the fruit of my body. I declare this day that I am a champion. I overcome because Christ has already overcome. Victory is mine. In all that I do, I will listen, I will wait, and I will respond in accordance to the will of God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Wow, that's a good one. I never I never prepared that. That, that just came by the Spirit. All right, this morning, okay, I want to share something with us that the Lord, you know, drew my attention to this morning while I was praying. I hope the things that we're saying is making sense, okay? All right. Like I said, this morning we're dealing with something that it really, you know, uh, uh, touched my heart. All right. I mean, it was such a blessing to me while I was praying this morning, just, you know, uh, uh, having a nice time with the Lord. The Lord drew my attention, all right, to John 15, all right, verse 17. And I'll just give it straight to you. I've already done, uh, 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 you know, a, a session this morning on this uh, concept on TikTok. You know, TikTok is very short, very short, you know, just very, very short. 10 minutes, you're done. <laughs> so you give it straight, all right? But thank God for, you know, this kind of platform that we can also expand, amen, the word and expand what God is doing. But I love TikTok because, you know, you're dealing with the next generation, all right? I've got a, I've got a desire, a burden, okay, for young people, for young people, young people who don't know what life is all about, who are confused, who have been lied to, have been deceived, Many of them, all right, are, are, you know, are there. They've camped around TikTok. So we believe in God to continue to help us to speak, amen, to that platform because God, amen, they, they will be the next people that God is going to use. So we can't leave them out. So while we're dealing with, somebody said Facebook has become a place for, you know, old older people, people who are just very relaxed about life, who really don't, you know, they don't care again. They just, they, you know, there's a way somebody was describing Facebook, TikTok, and YouTube. I said, well, we want all. I want, I want to, you know, be able to take, you know, all of this platform. Of course, there are a few others there that, you know, in fact, there's another one that I always post, you know, our material, uh, uh, Tumblr. It's called Tumblr. That one is in another level. I mean, the craziness on Tumblr is another level. But we're there, all right, posting the word of God, posting the, you know, the concept of the kingdom, all right? So we want to take all this platform for the kingdom. And please, if you're listening and you want to be a blessing, please, please ask the Lord, how can I be a blessing to this ministry? Because particularly now, I do need your assistance financially. That's the truth. I do need your assistance. So if the Lord touches your heart, be a blessing to us. Okay, let's quickly go into what we're talking about this morning. Listen to what the Spirit of the Lord said to me. Very profound. God is relational, but he's also transactional. God is relational, but he is also transactional. Now, this statement, as simple as it may sound, it is the most powerful, amen, you know, belief system you can ever have. And if you understand it and you build on it, it will change your life. 
oftentimes when we when we engage God and we engage the Word of God remember we're dealing with prayer now how we understand God defines how we pray how we understand God defines how we pray you can't pray outside of amen, the framework of your knowledge of God of yourself and the world around you you pray amen what you believe you pray what you what you see you pray what you understand you pray the values that you have come amen to accept that's why when you listen to people pray amen, they, they, they pray differently the way people pray amen speaks to how they have been open to God to the things of God some people amen when they pray like I always say, if you listen to people's prayer, you will know where they are spiritually. You will know their spiritual orientation. You will know where they're coming from. And of course, you know where they are and you know where they're going. There is no place that exposes amen, our, our sense of understanding, our sense of ignorance than the place of prayer. And this is, I believe, the reason why God gave us amen, the tool of prayer because prayer is a place that we go to get to be spiritually developed, to get to be spiritually informed and of course, amen, transformed. We get to be informed and we get to be transformed, all right? Yes, I do believe that when we come to God in the place of prayer, rather than him just meeting the needs that we present to him, all right, he begins to use our request, amen, in fact, to start to change us. I believe prayer is more of a place where we get to change than where we go to collect. They would have just said, I believe that the place of prayer, amen, is more of where we go to be changed, where God engages us. I know the reason why most people don't pray is because they are afraid to engage God. They are afraid to open their heart. They are afraid to, ex it's like when you pray, you get to be exposed. <laughs> yes, because the moment you start praying, all right, no matter what you are presenting to God, God will start speaking to you, even about the things that you are not, you know, talking about, because you're a spirit being. Every human being, amen, can hear God. God will not create you to be a spirit, amen, without giving you the ability or capability, amen, to hear him. You may not, amen, respond, you know, uh, accurately, but you will hear him. And oftentimes when we hear him, we run to the wrong place. We run to the wrong people because of how we have been shaped, how we have been shaped, amen. Our environment shapes us. When, 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 when I came to where I'm living right now, the, 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 the nature, the environment, the kind of people here, you hardly see them. But, you know, you can feel, amen, that there's something in the air that, you know, is projecting something to you. One of the things that that environment is projecting is, is pride. It's, you stay on your, stay where you are, you know, I'll stay on my side, all right? D don't come near me, you understand? You, you hardly see the people because the houses are massive and big, you know, you, you, you know, where I'm staying is on the prop, you know, on, on an acre of two point something acres of land. So imagine, you see everything massive and big. Now all these things, if you grew up in an environment like that, it, it can insulate you from certain realities. So, so the first thing I did when I came here, I began to do what you call spiritual mapping. I began to do spiritual mapping. I began to seek to understand, amen, the kind of spirit, the kind of value system, all right, that governs, that rules the people, amen, in such an environment so that I'm not sucked in. You can be a man of God and be in a particular area and be living in a particular place, amen, and not be aware of the ruling spirit and not be aware of, amen, the, 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 the core, you know, a philosophy that governs that area. And before you know it, amen, you are buried. The Bible says the land swallows their inhabitant. Are you seeing how God is exposing things? So it's important, amen, that, you know, when we talk about prayer, that we, we don't just reduce it to just a need. We were looking at the scripture the last time. Let me quickly draw your attention to that scripture. I hope I can still locate it. Yes. The Bible says, that, then Jesus told them a parable 
Remember, whenever Jesus starts to speak in the parable, it means that he's speaking something very important, but he doesn't want that thing to be chipping down. So it, it's going to require people who can think, who are ready to go beyond just what they are hearing, who are ready, amen, to ask questions, who are ready to, you know, to dig deeper. That's why it's hidden. Truth are hidden in parables. Hallelujah. He was speaking to them in parable, amen, about their need. And I remember saying that the way we understand need, amen, is totally different from the way he's presenting need to us. There's a need. When you understand the need or you understand God's definition of need, it changes how amen, you look at life. It changes how you interact. It changes how you pray. There are people who have money and they don't think that they have a need to pray. There are people, amen, who have you know, all the good things of life. They, they've been brought into wealth and affluence, all right? So they don't think, all right, that there's a need to pray. You understand? That's why I said some time ago, when you, when you, when you move, let's say you move a church or you move from one region. Okay, let me just make it simple. Let's say you, are, you grew up in Africa with all the challenges and problems and need of Africa, all right? And you move to, you know, maybe a Western country where the, the, your day-to-day -day challenge in Africa, the issue of water, maybe for three days, you know, you've not had water, you understand? And then for seven days, there's no electricity. And then, you know, the issue of Wi-Fi, you know how you buy Wi-Fi, you spend all your, you know, all your money, all right, just to be online, you know, you data takes all your money, you understand? And, and you know all those needs, and, and then you, you're struggling with buying bread for 20 rand, you, you understand? And then you've got... You know those, you know social, you know day-to-day -day domestic needs, and you're, you're you're combating, you're fighting those needs da daily. Those are the those are the things that takes off <laughs> seventy percent of your prayer. You understand? Yes. And then suddenly you are moving to an environment where all those things are provided. Everything is provided for free because that is the environment that is you know how the society is you can just park your bicycle and walk into a shop there's nobody coming to steal your bicycle you understand everything you you, you don't need to be thinking oh I, how am i going to buy fuel this this month because the transportation system is excellent is 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 you know is 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 just there you know in fact, you, you, it's, it's better you pack your car and take public transport. You, you, you understand? So, it, that the fact that you have a car is not an issue to them. Nobody is looking at you and say, because you've got a car, therefore you have arrived. Like here, yeah, if you buy a car in Africa, it's like, wow, that guy's arrived. And if that car is a big one and is new, ah, then you're a, you're a big man. You, you're anointed. You understand? You know, the things that we boast about, look at the things that many of many of our men of God, all right, boast, you boast of, you know, the things that they pride themselves in, you know, you build a large house, you build, you know, this, you build that, you build this, you, you know, so that is what defines their glory, what they have built, you know, what they have amassed, you know, I'm living in a seven bedroom apartment, you understand? That is, to them, the reward of their prayer. And that's why a lot of people go there because that's Africa for you. That's the environment you live in. It's a tough environment. You pray and fast for 40 days just for you to be able to raise money for your rent. Now, they take you and they put you in a different environment where those things basically, you know, are like mates. Particularly if you have the qualification. Here you can have qualification. And you'll be struggling. And that's where people think something is wrong with them. Oftentimes, all those altars they tell you are built in your father's house. You need to go and pull them down. Those, you know, uh, uh, demons that are pursuing you from your bloodline. No, they are economic problems. <laughs> They are economic, you know, economic problem. They are the problem of bad leadership. So you are running from pillar to post. You are running for this from this prayer mountain to that, you know, you know, you know, deliverance house and that. So you are pursuing things, all right, that are not really an issue. That shouldn't be an issue to you. But guess what? On the flip side, God also used those things to build you up. 
that's if you're walking in the understanding because i believe that the reason why somebody like me i can survive where i am today or right, is because of the kind of environment amen that god has shaped me you see my environment i never allow my environment to swallow me up but i allow my environment to train me like david if David never went through the kind of things he went through, amen, he would never have been, you know, a leader who has a heart for God and for the people of God. Some of us, our environment have shaped us to such a level that we have become, you know, cruel. We become, you know, very hardened, okay? You've known poverty all your life. You've struggled. So by the time an opportunity is open for you, all right, you, you just keep grabbing. You know, I shared, you know, uh, um, a video maybe you will see it on my timeline it, it was shared by somebody and i reposted it you know of this monkey you understand that was given a bread you know as the monkey took the bread and was eating then they gave the monkey again a banana all right and the, the, the monkey took the banana and was eating and they gave the monkey something else it, the monkey has not finished eating the banana it left it, it took the, at the end of the day so much left on the ground the monkey can't even eat anything that's how many Christians, many of our political leaders, many of our church leaders, many of our apostles, prophets, you know, bishops. That's how, because now suddenly they've seen money. Uh, give it to me, give, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. They, they keep amassing what they don't even need. You now have more than enough and all you're thinking of just you yourself. You can't even see the environment that, wait a minute, there are people around me that need let me assist people and even when you seek to assist people you're assisting them to control them to bring them under your influence you're not assisting them to release them people will give you things all right you will think well they they love you and that's why they're giving no they're giving you things amen basically to want to control you because the more you keep giving an african person thing the more that person you know now begin to see you as a as a god you are my source oh come on so we said that God, amen, is a relational God, but he's also a transactional God. And we need to know these two aspects. In Africa, I think our idea of God is just basically transactional. We've not really gotten to know him as a father. And I mean, when I'm saying Africa, I mean what I'm saying. But I know this is a general principle to life. Okay. If, if you grew up in an environment where, you know, like I said, it could be in India, it could be in America, but, you know, you, you didn't grow up with your parent. You grew up with somebody who, 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 who you know, uh, brought you up. You understand? Yes. You know, a foster parent. And that person has been nice to you. Of course, you will look up to that person. You want that person, you, you, you know, you want to, you know, believe that that person will continue to assist you in life to the degree that you can be even limited, that you'll not be able to do certain things except give an approval. Is that not how we look at life? That because certain people, certain environment has done certain things for us to such a level that, all right, we think that those environments are our God. That's what we're seeing in Europe. Like I said, you see the flip side. In Europe, because, you know, they don't need to struggle for many of the things that Africans are struggling for, all right? So they think that there's no God. What, what, what God are you talking about? Which God are you talking about? That's why if you go with the mindset, amen, that you have, you know, as an African preacher, you go to some of this European, not America now, particularly Europe. There are certain places you go to in Europe, they look at you like, what are you talking about? Because those things you are fasting for, that you're praying for, that you're believing God for, that, you know, you're doing, you know, service and you, you've invited so many, come and see what God is going to do for you. He's always God is going to do it for you. Those things... I've already been provided for the government has provided for those things the houses are there you understand you pay almost like nothing and if you're a citizen I mean it's like it's your right to have XYZ to have those things so it, it also reduces them amen from getting to pressing if you don't know these things you will be benchmarked amen by amen the influence of the environment that is how Babylon amen rules and control people the paths of, of hell, amen. They, they've set these systems in place. Why do you think they want to keep Africa, amen, in a state of impoverishment? I mean, you look at, I mean, Africa basically amen, is resourcing, resourcing. I'm talking about raw material. Beyond raw material, human capital is resourcing, amen. 80% of the world's economy, all right, 
80% of the economy of the world, amen, is being resourced by African mineral. Yet Africa, all right, is impoverished. I mean, how does that work? How do you how, how how do you understand that? Well, because the powers that be, the system that be, amen, has designed it that way. And that's why the things that you know we saw happen in Cote d'Ivoire and, and, and in those parts of you know African world where they decided no, we don't want anything again with you know with the with the French people. They knew what they were doing. Because how can you be, I mean, you producing, you know, a, a large sum of uranium and gold, and yet you are still amen, in darkness, and yet amen, you, you're still impoverished. Look at the road, there is no infrastructure. So they will sponsor cool, they will sponsor this, they will do that, just to keep the people divided and keep the people in darkness. And then the church goes there and, all right, and capitalizes on the need of the people. All right, and say God is going to do it for you. I mean, that is a mis mismatch. That's what we are seeing. That is the ideologies of how people run, amen. Ministry. You can't run ministry on that, you know, dimension of, of life and think God is going to be happy with you. You, 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 you know, you weaponize poverty. You weaponize, amen, ignorance, and in fact, you weaponize bad leadership. Many of some of our leaders, you know, are, are, are in bed with many of our spiritual leaders are in, in bed with bad political leaders, bad political leaders. Those leaders go and pay homage to them and say, don't worry. That's why you watch election time. Watch where the, 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 the you know, the political leaders are going. They're going to the church. Hardly, yes, yeah, some of them go to the mosque, but how did you just them go to the mosque? They go to the churches and then they, they, you know once they give money and promise you know the, the, the bishop and the pastor say we're gonna do this for you gonna do that for you. that's why some of those pastors cannot challenge the bad leadership because they know what they have collected you don't know that as a church goer you don't know that you don't know amen the agreements amen these political leaders <clears throat> you will you will ask yourself why is it that a place like Nigeria Nigeria should be one of the most richest amen when I talk about rich, I'm talking about in a finished product. It, in Nigeria should be the next America that people should be struggling to want to go because of the br brain, the kind of brain people have there, because of the kind of resources pe pe people have there. That's why you find most Nigerians when they're out of, you know, that country, you understand? They always make it. Why can't they use the same brain, amen, to develop? Because the system, the evil system on ground will not allow. The moment you come with an idea, you want to do something, you understand? If it's not going to benefit the Baba, if it's not going to benefit the God knows who is there, you understand? They will frustrate that thing for you. They will frustrate it. It's a, it's a system. And those are the things we need to fight. God is just speaking and expanding this thing. I just wanted to share something very simple. But look at the way God is just expanding this thing. I mean, I just wanted to share that God is relational. Amen. But God is also transactional. But if we don't understand that aspect about God, about his ways, about his nature, amen, we will misrepresent him. We will misrepresent him. And that's what has been happening in the past amen, few years now, few decades now. We've misrepresented God. They tell us, no, you have to do this thing for God to be able to do something for you. It doesn't work like that. Yeah, listen, listen, I was just reading a scripture. Let me quickly show you again that scripture. Look at what, look at what in John 15, 7 says, if you remain in me. Oh, how I wish we can emphasize on that. How I wish we can, amen, begin to turn the heart of uh, the church, the body of Christ. All right, that all of this gymnastic, all of these things that we're pursuing and running after, if we can just, amen, channel our energy to John 15, 7. If, look at that, the word if is transactional. Like I said, if I say to my son, Samuel, please, could you do X, Y, Z for daddy? And he said, okay, daddy, I'll do it. And he went and he did it in record time. And he did it very well. What do you think I'm going to do? 
Even, even if I never promised him giving him anything, don't you think I'm going to reward him for that? Why do you think I will reward him? Because I want to prove, I want to show him that I appreciate what he did and that he did it very well. I will, I will reward him. He, he never asked for that. He just obeyed. He just obeyed him and his father. Because he knows that I'm, I'm, I'm daddy, I'm, I'm father. All right, he goes. He knows. He understands what fatherhood means. The fatherhood is, amen, when father speaks, I must obey. That is Isaac for you. Father said, Isaac, we're going to Moriah in one of the mountains God is going to show us. We're going there to sacrifice. The father took the wood, laid, it, laid, laid the wood on his head. You know, historians actually said that Isaac was about 17 years old when that happened. Some, you know, some historians say, you know, uh, maybe he's uh, uh, not as old as that. Some said, well, he's, so no matter what, Isaac was not two years old. Neither is he five years old. Neither is he ten years old. He had the opportunity to fight and say, no, daddy. No, daddy. I'm not, I'm not, I me. Mean, or, you know, this wood, daddy, this wood I'm carrying, you know, no. How do we carry wood? <laughs> to, did you notice that Isaac, when they got there, Isaac asked the father, we have the wood, we have the knife, we have the fire. Where is the sacrificial lamb? What was the reply of the father? God will provide. Ah. Could something be wrong with our understanding of fatherhood in our day? Could something be wrong? Because if we don't understand fatherhood, our entire structure of Christianity and spirituality is built on a rubble. Is built on a sinking sand. Jesus. I'm telling you, friends, I just wanted to, you know, just drop the scripture and then let people go about their day-to-day. -day. But God is expanding this word. Our wrong understanding of fatherhood, amen, can lead to a wrong, amen, theology of God. Note what I've said. God is, amen, by nature, God is relational, but he is also transactional. And the two must work concurrently. You must understand the two. One must not outrun the other. The two must work together. The understanding of these two. The way your father or you interact with your father. Alright? When you were born, how as you're growing up, would define and determine how your life will pan out. As it is in the natural, so it is in the spirit. The way God has been introduced to us is the way we will relate with him. If I say to my son, like I said, and he does, I reward him. But if I say to my, my son and say, please, can you do X, Y, Z? And he just walked away. In fact, walked away and eased and snubbed me and ignored me. How do you think I will, I'm going to react to him? How do you think I'm going to amen, respond to him? What do you think he has just done? Disobeyed me, disrespected me. Amen. Basically saying that, amen, I'm nothing. That my position as a father in his life means nothing to him. So do you think suddenly I'm not, I'm not going to start slapping him with blessing? And say, oh wow, what, what you said my son, you know, it, it is very nice. What you did is nice. In fact, here is that key for God knows what. Here is that, you know, uh, Xbox you've been asking me for. Here is that, you know, uh, uh, you know, a uh, bicycle. You're... No, no, I'm going to withhold my blessing because I want to teach him a lesson. I don't want to kill him. I can't say because of what he did, all right, and then suddenly because I want to punish him and I know I'm going to put his hand in the fire just for me to let him feel that you disobeyed your, no, put, put him, put his hand in the fire. I'll never do that. Hell was not created for, amen, God's children. Hell was created, amen, for, for the devil, his fallen angels, and those who refuse God, who rebel and say, we will not follow you, we won't serve you. That's what hell was created for. 
and people amen have begun to experience hell before they finally go to the lake of fire don't fool yourself when you disobey god that is you in fact you will begin to experience hell Are you seeing how God is speaking to us? Are you seeing it? We've got to understand this because I want our orientation to prayer to change. I want the way we understand prayer, amen, to be renewed, to be reformed. Prayer is not a place we go to to lambast God, amen, with our request. While we have issues of disobedience, amen, issues of rebellion pending while we have amen a life that refuses to walk to obey to trust god amen and then but we we want god to do xyz for us somebody did what was wrong and by the leading of the spirit i was led to correct the person and the person began to rake and rant and you know i'm like okay that's fine but my position as a prophet is to bring correction. Is to bring alignment. I will never see something that is evil, something that is against the will of God, amen, and turn my face away. Particularly if I know that thing is going to hurt other people. So you can be the Pope, you can be the Bishop, you can be the Apostle, you can be the President. If God gives me the grace and the wisdom, amen and the opening to say to to speak to you i will speak to you of course i won't i won't i won't be you know uh, 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 what they call it now I, I, I won't be rude but i will tell you people don't want to hear the truth today they don't I, they, 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 no no they don't want to hear the truth but the truth is what set us free but we can't be free amen of the truth with the truth if we're not ready to listen that is why there's going to be judgment that is why amen you know a people amen god uh, uh, judged by god, god you know god condemned amen a generation in the days of Noah. we all have it it's still in the bible the generation of Noah, amen perished why because they disobeyed god why because they lived their life amen outside of the principles and the values of god god used noah amen who the bible call in fact a righteous preacher check the bible the bible called noah a righteous preacher the life of noah the things he was doing amen was preaching to them they refused to believe how will they know without a preacher that person you know is living amen, a life amen, that is in rebellion to the ways of God. And you know that the life that person is living is in fact leading other people you know, astray. And you turn away just because all right you don't want that person all right to charge at you you don't want that person you know you know to, to get angry at you you don't want them amen yes to call you names that is what the bible says you are ashamed of 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 christ before me he said if you're ashamed of me before people i will also amen yes be ashamed of you before my father and his angels you think i'm bothered about your position your influence your money you think that bothers me it doesn't bother me my values is source in god and in his word so if god permits me to tell you the truth i will tell you the truth i tell myself to do, tell myself the truth If people refuse to live a life that is in alignment with the will of God, what do you do? You walk away. You can't force the truth on people, but they must hear the truth. They must know the truth because at the end of the day, the truth is not just what sets us free, it's what also sets society free. Where we are today is because certain people have chose to embrace the lie, to embrace falsehood, to embrace false gospel and they are projecting that false, go false gospel on us. No, you, you can have your own truth. You can stand for what you believe, but don't bring your truth to me. I don't have my own truth. I have the truth, which is the word of God. And when you read the word of God, amen, the word of God is speaking to you about truth. The word of God cannot be telling you to do something that, amen, negates the principles of God. The principles of God are general principles. They are universal. The truth is universal. 
it doesn't amen, apply in Africa, but it is not applicable in US or in Europe. No, the truth is applied to every home, to every man, to every woman, to every church, amen, to every apostle, to every leader, to every you know government official. As long as they are breathing, they must hear the truth. Why? Because that breath belongs to God. The life is not yours. The one who, if I walk into a home or into a company, I must abide by the rules, by the vision, by the values of that environment, or else I get out. As long as you're on earth, amen, there are values, principles that God has established. If you don't want to live by that, get out of the world. Go live in Mars, go live in Jupiter or Pluto somewhere, go there. But the earth is the Lord. The earth is the Lord. The earth is the Lord. Amen. The people who dwell in it and the fullness thereof. The earth belongs to God. The Bible, we read this, we read the scripture. Amen. God laid, God has laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens. You didn't lay it. America did not lay the foundation. European constitution did not lay the foundation, the philosophy of the heavens and the earth. UN did not lay that foundation. George Bush and uh, 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 the, you know the, the Obamas of this world, you understand? They didn't lay. No religion laid the foundations of the heavens and the earth. God did. And that foundation is not a physical thing. It's a philosophy. It's a way of living. It's a way of thinking. You can't come with your own foreign idea and think, well, God is just going to accept it. There's nothing like that. You can create your own idea and create your own belief system and try to enforce it, but not on me and not on the church of the living God. It's only a matter of time before you see God, you know, come down to judge. So, as we understand God as a relational God, we must also understand that it's transactional. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, then you can ask whatsoever. Look at that. There's no limit to what you can ask. Why? Because they know, amen, that <clears throat> your needs have passed through, amen, yes, the regulations, the value system of how God meets need by living and abiding in his word. Have you noticed that when you live your life in alignment with the word of God, the certain needs suddenly just fall into the dustbin. In fact, you'll be ashamed that you used to live and think in a particular way. Oh my word. Have you ever read the word of God and you're like, oh God help me here. God help me here. Because suddenly the, the word convicted you. The word convinced you. The word brought you to light. That's what the word of God does. It's a lamp unto my feet. You don't have the word of God in your life. You will always walk in darkness and fall into the ditch. Your word, not the word of another man, not the word of the president, not the word of the great philosopher. Some people today have built their life on, you know, on, the, on the words of Socrates, on the words you know, of, you know, of all these you know, philosophers. The people who build their life on the words of those great philosophers, where is those things today? Where is the, 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 the Greek empire? Where is the Roman empire? Where is the Babylonian empire? They've become rubbles. But their ideas are still being projected and they're still becoming rubbles. That's why we say the battle of the last day is the battle of truth. What is that? It's the battle of philosophy. It's a battle of ideologies. What do you believe? What do you believe? If you remain in me and my words, not the words, amen, of men, not the words of your politicians, not the words, amen, of your bishop. Some people believe more in the words of their bishop because the bishop picked the word, the apostle picked a word. Amen. The prophet picked the word. Amen. The, the, the pastor picked one word from the word of God and built a whole castle on it. And then you believe in it. You believed in the lie. The word of God. Amen. Yes. Is, is, is an entire council. The 
the word of God is an entire order of a life is a system you can hold on to one truth and reject the other truth no they say when you're invited to the table of God's word you don't and pick what you want you eat the entire thing they say to Ezekiel eat the entire scroll eat the whole loaf when we are all feeding from the table of of the meal of god's of god's food guess what we will be changed into christ likeness the reason why we're so divided and we have all kinds of denominations and all kinds of ideologies because we eat what we want to eat people pick one aspect of the word and overblow it and then they come up with denomination then they come up with ideas they come up with their own philosophy they come up with their own tradition and because they have money to promote it suddenly you think what they have come up with is the main thing no somebody lied to you go into the word and find out what has been written for yourself and stop believing in a lie if you remain you remain you have to remain you have to be there you remain don't jump in there and jump out you have to remain I'm laying a foundation of how we can effectively pray because prayer is beyond just what you say what you say come from a place it's coming from an ideology it's coming from a belief system what you're saying hallelujah is coming from a thinking pattern you can't just say things and think well God approves it You can't just say things and you know and believe that yes uh, uh, it's fine it, it can just work out what you say must come from the place where the word of god earlier has dwell you've been changed by the word the word that's why when you are changed by the word your prayer request will always be an incense before god when you are changed by the word your prayer amen will be in unison will be in harmony with god you won't pray something outside of his will that's why i keep telling us that prayer amen is two-dimensional prayer is two-dimensional the first dimension and they are in order you can't shift them the first dimension of prayer is knowing what the word of god says because when you know what god says when you know what has been written amen when you know the mind of god you know the will of god and then you can't say oh, well now i know the mind of god no i fool man no no he said then you ask then you ask then it's given to you because you're not going to be asking amen from from a point of ignorance what did the Bible say for? We don't even know how to pray. The Spirit, how can the Spirit be praying when you don't have the Word? The Holy Spirit will make use of the deposit of the reservoir of the Word of God in you to, amen, to help you to pray. You think the Holy Spirit is just some mechanical thing. We said yesterday that God's things, spiritual things are not automatic and they are not automated. Spiritual things are not automatic and they are not automated just put it there so every day the thing will just be producing no no it doesn't work like that god is relational he wants you to come daily daily they said amen the, the you know the ashes of yesterday's fire must be taken out of the altar you must bring in fresh wood the fire on the altar must not go out it must burn daily for it to burn daily somebody must keep it alive <laughs> For the fire to burn daily, somebody must be fueling that fire. Because at the end of the day, the light, amen. Yes, the more you, the more you spend light, the more you, 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 you know, you keep the light, the, the, the light on. The more you burn oil, the more the weak, amen, get weaker. So the more you need to trim the weak, and the more you need to, amen, keep fueling that thing, amen, with oil daily, daily. This is what the anointing is for. The anointing is not for you to go out there and da, 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 no, 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 no. The anointing is for you to sustain your relationship with him. When they say, touch not my anointed, you have been anointed, amen, for a relationship. No, when we think anointing, we just think of execution. Every execution has got a root, has got an history. God is relational. If you cannot relate with God, forget the things of God. Just, just forget. Forget, you know, 
walking with Christ because it's a walk. Enoch walked with God. 300, we've been tracking that. 365 years, Enoch walked with God. Enoch walked with God. 365 years. How did the man do it? That's something we've got to decode. A man walked 365 years. He wasn't tired. Why would he be tired? Because his work with God, amen, is what energizes them. When you walk with God daily, hallelujah, God keeps you alive. He empowers you daily. So you can't be walking with God and you're tired. In fact, amen, if God never said, Enoch, let's go do the remaining work, amen, in heaven, he, he, Enoch would have continued to walk with God, amen, 6,000 years. Because walking with God is relational and is transactional. Because when you hear God, he tells you to, to, to do something. Imagine, you're walking with God and God says, uh, you know, tomorrow I want us to meet at uh, you know, the T-junction. You know that T-junction? Yes. You respond. You can't say you're walking with God, but God says, that's the place I want us to meet tomorrow. And you're not there. If you abide in me, to abide is to walk with him. When you are walking, amen, you hear God. You, will, you can listen to his voice. Ah, I can't hear God. The reason why you can't hear God is because you're not walking with him. You're not abiding in his word. You're not abiding in his presence. You are too preoccupied with your own thing. Oh, life is so difficult. Oh, things are not yet. Because you don't have time for the most important thing in your life. I can't hear God. Hey, I'm just overwhelmed by all this need. Because you want to be overwhelmed. If you learn to push things aside, that's, my, that's me. I push things and push them aside. We'll deal with you later. First of all, let's deal with this one. Let's, let's talk to God. Let's talk to God. Because it's from there we get perspective. It's from there we get perspective. It's from there. You know, when you start talking with God, He starts talking to you. <laughs> Oh Lord, I love you. When you start talking with God, He starts talking to you. Don't expect God to talk to you if you're not talking to Him. What did He say? Draw near to me, and I will what? Draw near. He didn't say I will draw near to you, then you draw. No, no, no. He said, You draw near to me, and I will. So if you have to initiate the thing, that's why you have to teach your children how to draw near to God. It's an orientation. Pastors, leaders in churches, they teach the people to depend on them, not on God. Because they are insecure and they need the people around them, you know, to boost their ego, to boost their relevancy. Can you be so effective to the point you build people that they no longer need you? <laughs> that is effective leadership. That you build people to the level that you're no longer in need. You go to another place where you're in need. That's why people, when they start a church, they die there. They start the church maybe at the age, you know, 30. At the age 70, they are still pastoring the same church. Something is wrong with you. The church is not your heritage. It's not your inheritance. <laughs> You build to exit. You know what I said? You build to what? To exit. You build to exit, to leave it behind. That's the pattern Jesus showed us. Three and a half years he was done. He left it for guys who, <laughs> who are still trying to find themselves. But when the Holy Spirit came, because he promised, I'm not going to leave you alone. Do we have enough belief and confidence in the Holy Spirit? Oh, Jesus. If you remain in me, God, I will remain in you. I choose to remain in you today. I choose to remain. I refuse to be distracted from things. Because the enemy knows that when you are in congruence, when you are in harmony with God, you, you, are, you are a leather weapon. You are the most powerful.
powerful weapon on earth when you are in harmony so he will continue to do things and bring people into your space into your life all right to to distract you when you are distracted you are you, you know you are scattered amen he weakens you so i don't keep issues that will you know weaken me and, and deplete my, my 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 energy no 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 Are you hearing? If you remain, Jesus asked a question. In fact, he was saying, he said, that he hoped he will find faith when he returns. Will the Son of Man find people living and still walking by faith when he returns? Talk, talking about occupying till he comes. Do we have the kind of orientation, spiritual orientation, that when he returns, tomorrow or next year or 10 years time or 100 years time if if we are alive that we are still remaining that we are still remaining we are still abiding is somebody listening can we have that kind of belief system that when he returns he will meet, he will find faith on earth. Or will the wind of Babylon sweep us away? The challenges of the times that is dragging people away from prayer. You see, prayer, like I said, it's not, it's not about God meeting your need. It's about you walking with God. That's the essence of prayer. Prayer is a place where we get to be resourced. We get to be energized daily. We get to be empowered. It's not just about you. Listen, when you understand the Father, you understand God as your Father. <laughs> he said before you ask for something, it will be given to you. When you understand the Father, the idea of need, your perspective of need changes. He's your Father. The duty of a father is to make sure that, amen, the children are provided for, are cared for, are protected. You understand? They are resourced. It is an irresponsible father that will look at the shoe of the son or daughter, you know, singing praises to God, open, and will take his face away. Even the most poorest father, when, you see, there's something about the need of your children that pushes, that moves you. I was in a need of a laptop, but I knew my daughter need a laptop. There's a need my daughter, you know, my daughter needs a laptop. I need a laptop, but you know what? I made sure that I provided for her need first. I, because I know that a day is going to come, I will need to be communicating to her with a laptop. I know that the laptop will encourage our work, our, our school work. I need a laptop. But I decided I can always get myself one when, when I have the opportunity and when the provision came. So I saw a nice laptop. In fact, at one point, I was almost in Jemima. Don't you think you want to give daddy this laptop? <laughs> But you see, she needed that laptop. So what did I do? I bought the laptop for her. I didn't buy a phone for her. Will she need the phone? I don't think so now. I don't think so. She's gonna be, she's gonna be 12. Oh, now 12 years old, they've got phones. No, no, my daughter does not need a phone now. My daughter needs a laptop. It's a priority because that will enhance our work. And that's what I did. That is how the father also meets our need. He knows what you need at every given interval. He knows what you need. All this prayer, prayers, collection, prayer, God knows what. Well. People have built powerful ministry on your need, on a lie. And you think, wow, that man loved me. If you go there, the man can pray. If he can pray, he must teach you how to pray. You hear what I said? If he can pray, he must teach you. If he can fish, he must teach you how to fish. 
when somebody amen relates with you for you to depend on them every day every week every month every year they're not helping you in fact they are enslaving you did you hear what i said they are enslaving you there are ministry today all right that are built on the principle of pharaoh principle of egypt You keep building pyramid. You think you're building ministry. Ha! Go to that church. That guy in Abuja. He can pray. He. One of my, one of the, one of the disciples, one of my disciples that I trained when I was a pastor, he starts sending me, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a prayer request, a prayer program of this particular. I don't want to mention the the pastor's name, but it's very popular now on the area of prayer, and it's built big ministry in Abuja, Nigeria on prayer and people are giving from, from Kenya, from God knows where they're sending money to him, so he was sending me some of the, and I called him, and I said, in fact I didn't call him I sent a message to him, I said you dare not again send me these links you know where I stand on this truth so if the things that I have taught you 25 years ago is no longer true to you then let it be but you don't send me to so he had to send a message to me and start apologizing no he didn't mean it that way no because you the things that i taught you that ought to have built the foundation of what prayer is you never believe the need but you're looking for you know somebody that is it's gonna do it now for you god does not work like that you know that I don't build ministry to you know to enslave people to inf our ministry is to set people free anything including prayer or fasting that will enslave you that will put you in a state where you feel in fact most people don't even know they're enslaved and it's for that reason many people today regretted joining tb joshua because all they're looking for, you know, is God that will solve their problem. Problem is part of life. Jesus said it. Men always ought to pray. There's a need. So what is the need that Christ is talking about? As long as we live in this fallen world, we will always have need. Listen, people will always disappoint you. People will always take advantage of you. You will always lose things. Yes, you will always be in need. There will always be financial need. There will always be, you know, marital problem. Yes, you know, many of you right now already know what I'm going through in terms of, you know, my, my, my marriage. Yes. Did I ask for it? No, I didn't ask for it. Did I see it coming? Yes, I did. But I believe that God was going to, you know, you know, help me out. And it got to the point that, well, it cannot be helped. It, it, it collapsed. So what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to put, you know, a neck, a, a rope on my neck and kill myself just because, you know, a relationship never worked out? There will always be a need in our life. And if we don't know how to manage those needs based on the principle of truth, you'll be running from pillar to post and you'll end up hurting yourself more. And the enemy will finish you because he knows that he has destroyed your theology, he's destroyed your foundation, he's destroyed your belief system. What am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to take God to court? I said the very thing that I've, I've challenged all my life, that I've stood against has happened to me. <laughs> Is my life not a reflection of Job? I've, I, am I supposed to say, you know, the principle of Job no longer applies to life? That God can give you power, money to build things and tomorrow it collapses the thing for his glory. <laughs> Are you not supposed to say, no, it's not biblical, it's not the word of God. Who told you that? Our orientation of God and the way God moves in our life is skewed. And you're pumping money to a ministry and you think the man is going to perform a magic. There's no magic. The work of any man of God is to help you to see and understand 
things from God's perspective, encourage you, stand with you, and let God give, amen, his verdict. When God speaks, and you know God has spoken, what do you do? You embrace it. Because all things work together. What? Why do you think they said, they made that statement, all things? Because they want you to understand that even that thing that you think is not working together, that thing you think is terrible, that thing you think, all right, is painful, that thing, hallelujah, that you look and you're like, God, why would somebody do such a thing? It's working together for good. That is, a, a, you know, a, a principle that most people are not willing to accept. That is a principle people are not willing to accept. But that is a principle that will change your life. That is a principle that will transform your existence. All things work together for good. If you abide in me, as long as I know I'm abiding in him. I don't know who's calling me while I'm broadcasting. Hello, who is this? I thought somebody's calling for help. <laughs> Maybe they need they need a prayer, you know. Okay, so okay, we can do it, deal with that later. But even that they must stop, you know, disturbing me. Are you getting what, what I'm sharing, friends? If you abide in me and my words abide in you, the word is a regulator. The word, amen, is a refiner. The word of God, yes, is an amplifier of truth and the mind of God. The word, hallelujah, yes, is a renewer. I mean, just read scripture. The Bible tells us what the word of God is capable of doing. The Bible says, amen, the word of God will refine us. When you are refined, you just know that, well, that is the request I need to present. This one is not a request. This one, it's just me trying to trying to bluff, trying to prove too that I have arrived, I can have something. Some of the things we call needs, in fact, you know they are not needs. They are just wants. They are just you flexing your, you know, your selfish carnal desire. Yes. If you abide in him and his word abide, he said, ask anything, anything, and it will be done. Wow, what a guarantee. God is a transactional God, but he's also a relational father. The two must work hand in hand. When you know that, you don't seek to bribe God. You can't bribe your way into his, into his heart. You can't bribe your way, amen, either by money or even by spiritual things. Somebody, like, I'm going to fast. I'm going to fast 40 days. <laughs> It's good to fast. The fast is to align you. It's to bring you into unity and into harmony. So you can hear God clearer. You can hear him better. And you can have the power to obey him. But not to change his mind. Not to change his word. Not to change his standard. Your fasting cannot change God's standard. Your fasting cannot change, amen, the ways of God, the will of God. Your fasting cannot change, amen, the principles of Christ. No, you're sorry. Sorry, I'm sorry if I've just bust your bubble. <laughs> Remember, I wrote a book on fasting. So you can go read my book on, on, on fasting. Give you clear insight of what fasting is all about. Because those churches, those ministers will tell you, no, come, we will fast, we will fast. There are some ministry in Nigeria, they'll tell you they're doing, you know, 120 days, 100 days. I'm like, hey, you guys, <laughs> you've done beyond Christ. <laughs> Someone is, I'm, I fasted for 80 days. So what do you think that is? Or what do, how do you think that makes me feel? That you are some spiritual guru? It proves your foolishness and your stupidity. Because not even Jesus fasted for 80 days. When you tell your congregation or people following you, you fasted for 80 days. You're projecting something in their mind that is evil. You are building a false doctrine in their mind. Jesus fasted for 40 days. That's it. And he didn't fast another time again. 
I live a fasted life. So I can tell you this thing. And now I, I do fast continually. But I know I'm fasting. I don't, I don't think, maybe while I was a young Christian, I was fasting to get things. As I grew and I began to understand spiritual things, spiritual things, not the things that sound or may look spiritual, not religious things that we call spiritual. Because today when somebody tells you, this is spiritual. <laughs> when you probe that thing, you realize it's not spiritual. It's just being spooky. In fact, they are soulish things. When you begin to understand God and the ways of God, what you begin to seek for is to be more like Christ. Christ is the pattern. He is the standard and he is the yastic of life, of ministry. Anything Jesus did not do, you are not permitted to do it. Anything you don't see Christ do, you do it, you build an, an altar, you build, amen, yes, a high place. You build an idol. And you can do that in your mind or through your hands. Let me repeat it again. Anything you do not see Jesus do and you do it, you have built an altar, you build an high place. And it's coming for you. It's coming for you. Every, Jesus said, every tree my father has not planted will be what? Uprooted. <laughs> what do you think trees are to him? Trees are ministry. <laughs> Trees are relationship. Trees are things, amen, that takes the resources of God, that wastes the resources of God. Because for a tree to be planted and to remain, that tree is sucking, is sapping, amen, the resources of God. You don't have a resource to your own, to yourself. So they say, why come bury the ground? Cut it down. It's coming for you. It's coming for that thing you call, you know, your ministry. It's, it's going to pull it down. It's, it's coming for a glorious church without spot, without wrinkle, and without blemish. Don't fool yourself. You better start adjusting and stop that nonsense prayers. You can't bribe God. You can't accelerate the things of God. But prayers that are not in alignment with the will of Christ. So before you begin to pray, seek to know Christ. Seek to know his ways. Seek to know his word. In fact, before you begin to seek to know his kingdom, seek to know the king. Many of us, we've written, spoken, declared things about the kingdom of God. Why wow, our understanding of the king it's very minimal. It's very meager. And yeah, we've, we've written, we built big things about the kingdom. It's all description. It's time to come into experience. We were with him on the mountain. The things we're speaking of are, are the things we've seen. We've, amen, we've touched our hands and handled. We've got to bring the nations to the place, amen, of experiencing Christ. When they experience Christ, they will experience the kingdom. When they say the kingdom of God, amen, yes, is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That is a life in alignment with Christ the King. We cannot experience or function in the kingdom outside of the ascended revelation of Christ. He is the king upon the throne. He is the king who sits upon the waters. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, then ask. When those two things are not done and you are asking, you are asking a miss, James. You ask, but you receive not. Why? Because you ask a miss. You ask for your own selfish grat gratification. You ask for your own selfish desire. You ask, amen, to promote your own thing. There are people who are asking things around church and around what they call ministry that is for their own selfish gratification. And you think God is going to meet that need. 
in fact oftentimes when people tell we pray and God answered our meal it's not the, it's not God that answered those needs because God will not answer a need all right that that negates the nature the values the principle the standard amen of Christ who is the pattern so when you see, when you hear people say God look at what God has done and in the midst of all that thing they're showing you please look for Christ if you can't find Christ it's not God answered that prayer God will not answer a need that will lead you to darkness, that will lead you to compromise, that will lead you to forget his son, that will lead you to forget his spirit, that will lead you to promote something, amen, that is not revealing Christ to the people. Oh, come on, that's, that's a hard one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The nature of the days that we live in re, 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 de, re, requires and demands that we go and re-examine the things that we have built and we have called God. Men are building all kinds of gods in the minds of people and using prayer, using fasting, using, you know, even the Bible. People have built all right, powerful, you know, soulish ministry on strands of truth, strands of truth. I don't want to start mentioning names. They have so built and perfect this thing that even governments, governors go to those churches and pay homage and you see them like this. <laughs> when you build truth on one strand, you build ministry on one strand of truth and you think you've arrived, God is coming for you. When he begins to shake the tree of that ministry, God told me years ago, about a particular ministry. I will not mention the name. God said, I will shake the leaves of this tree and every leaf will fall, not one will remain. And I will speak death to the root and it will dry up. But for those who seek me and who desire my ways, I will begin to bring forth a shoot out of that which has been cut off. <clears throat> I will not forget because if I mention the name of the ministry, it will say, how dare you? <laughs> but I heard it clear. I was still in Nigeria. And the ministry now, they are building towering things, towering things. And you think, Who, will that prophecy ever come to pass? That's not for me to think of. It's for God to fulfill what he has said. It's for me to announce what he has proclaimed. We need to be careful. Lest you think that the, the prosperity and the increase of what you stand for in your building means the approval of God. Sometimes it means God is keeping that thing for a day of destruction. That's the story of the Tower of Babel. God did not come down when the thing was on the foundation. They had gotten to certain height. Father, we honor your name. I hope the things we've shared this morning really has brought perspective and understanding to our lives, to our space, because that's my intention. I want you to see these things, to appreciate this thing. We want to build for Christ. We want to build a strong prayer life. Prayer is an entire spiritual philosophy. It's not, a, it's not a strand of an activity. It's an entire spiritual philosophy that must walk and speak to every part of our existence as people of God. Your prayer cannot be outside of your relationship with God. Your prayer cannot be outside of your relationship with the body of Christ. Your prayer cannot be outside of your relationship, all right, with your brother, with your neighbor. You see, the things that Jesus said in his word, they are not just there for fun. Or, well, he's just wasting his word. When he says, when you come, amen, to the altar and your brother has an issue against you, he says, leave your offering, go and settle with that person and then come offer those things are principle men always ought to pray and not to faint do we abide by those principles or do we only pray when we think 
hey i've got a desperate need pray in season and out of season prayer is relational lord we thank you we honor you for your word your word will not fail your truth will not fail heaven and earth will pass away but not a stroke not the jot of your word will go unfulfilled so grant us once again insight open the eyes of our mind open our understanding give us an awakening in this day where you are ringing the bell the alarm of your spirit is is sounding and is becoming louder and clearer we cannot ignore what you're saying to us lord as you continue to separate us from the charlatans and the merchants people who peddle your word who sell the truth help us not to look at these people and celebrate them but may we look at them with pity and walk away. <clears throat> may we build a pattern of a life that is in sync with your life, with your nature. Grant us to continue to look into the perfect law of liberty, not being a forgetful hearer. <clears throat> Teach us how to pray, Jesus. Of, of course, the disciples of Jesus... They knew that the way they were praying was not really cutting it. They said, teach us how to pray as John taught his disciples. God help us. As we come into this new day, teach us how to pray. Teach us how to transact with you and your kingdom. Teach us how to walk. Help us not to depend on the soul on the ways of man bring us out of the soul order into the dimension of a spiritual life we ask you grant us a heart circumcised because indeed that is what prayer means and that is where prayer starts from he said break up the fallow ground so to yourself in righteousness we ask you this morning oh god that our heart will become a good ground where the things of your kingdom can be sowed can be planted make us a people of light in the midst of darkness remove from our mindset the neediness the insecurity the fear and the, and the lies we have bought, things we have inherited, altars that we have built in the name of other gods that in fact today we believe is you. You said to Gideon, I'm going to do a new thing <coughs> in, the, in your life and through your life, but first go to your father's house and pull down the altars of Baal and the pole of Ashtoreth your father has built and then come let's let's transact ah we ask you Lord in this new day that we'll be bold as you empower us to go into this house called our father's house because indeed we are the product of our fathers of our parents there are things we have inherited that are not in alignment with your ways and your will things we've inherited ignorantly belief system we have inherited from false order false church wrong doctrines that we have come to lay hold on as this is the way we pray this is the way see our father got breakthrough from it but your father has been pouring libation to Baal. The gospel where we are bought is the gospel of Mama. Baal is the God of fertility. He's the God of human economy. 
Baal is that spirit called Mammon. We build things on the altar of Baal. You will notice that when Elijah began to repair the altar of God, he, he brought back amen, the economic system of heaven. Not only did they pour water, because you know, when we talk about the restoration of the altar, we always think of amen, the, 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 the bulls and the water. You forget that Elijah also said, bring grain, 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 point around the altar. Is the principle of the economy of God. He restored back the order because the nation have been sourced by the economy of Baal. That's why God cut down the economy, shut down the heavens, no rain. Because they believe that Baal is the God of rain. Baal is what, amen, is what provides rain and, and fertility. And, and that's why they indulge them there in, in, themselves in all kinds of sexual immorality. When you see men of God, pastors who have indulged themselves in sexual immorality, they have opened themselves to the altar of Baal. It's that thing that empowers them. That's how they renew their, their sacrifice and their covenant. That's why the, the system of the world projects sexual perversion. It's the spirit of Baal. It has wangled its way into the church and into the heart of those who call themselves gatekeepers. That's why in this new day, every one of us must look into our life and seek for purity. Purity. That's how God restores our economy. Our personal economy, our family economy, and the economy of our nation must be restored on the altar of holiness, righteousness, exalts a nation. That's how powerful righteousness is. <laughs> Maybe you don't know. Righteousness can literally hold the economy of a nation. Everything can be collapsing. But let's find righteous people. The Bible says that man, Noah, he was a righteous man. Therefore, he found everywhere you see righteousness, you find God's favor. You seek God's favor, but you don't want to walk in righteousness. It's another spirit I'll be projecting. That's why we must ask the Lord to help us to marry our public life and our private life into one order. When we abide in his word and his word abide in us, friends, we can go out and boldly declare, there's no sin in my life. Because Christ has become unto you righteousness. Christ is the one sanctifying you. Come on, friends. God is no longer turning his way, his eyes away from, you know, perversion. We're bringing down the altar of Baal. And when we bring down the altar of Baal, we're going for Jezebel. Are you hearing? There's a generation that will destroy the entire generation of Jezebel. That's why our apostolic belief system, our sense of kingdom government must be precise and accurate. The kingdom of God, the government of the kingdom of God starts with the people. It's not just something you go and execute out there. It starts with you. If Christ cannot govern your life, you have nothing to build or say to the world because they will challenge you. Jesus we know, Paul we know. Who are you? Hallelujah. We bless your name, Father. Grant us grace. We are in search of what is called the Asian path. We want to find the Asian path. We want to restore and recover all that your desire, all that you desire for us in this new day. Have your way. Take your place. May your kingdom continue to come into my life, into my space. Continue to invade everything my life is and represents. Let the warfare of your kingdom continue to prosper and advance in my life and through my life. This is my prayer, O oh God. That I will not back down, that I will not come down. We're building. We're restoring the gate of Zion. We're rebuilding the burnt gates and the broken walls. 
not one gap will be found wall to wall we will build friends call upon his name call upon his name it's a brand new day hallelujah in Jesus name amen and amen amen friends we are done this morning thank you so very much for you know being part of this morning's live broadcast i thought i was just gonna you know share something you know for maybe 30 minutes but the spirit of the lord really came down and really drew us into this powerful session i'm grateful to god in the way he's been speaking you know to us on this platform please continue to pray for me continue to pray for this walk we want to remain all right a place where the truth will be proclaimed without reservation we want to continue to declare and to announce amen the demand of god for our day without hesitation without reservation without compromise amen we want to continue to proclaim and and lead a people to the place where their life will bring glory and praise to god yes for this reason we live that we may live a life that honor him for his good pleasure we live. Amen. In him we live, in him we move, in him we have our being. Let your light so shine that men may see it and give glory to God. Thank you so very much. Well, this morning we've dealt with a beautiful principle. Amen. And I believe that this principle has really helped you. We've been talking about in the school of prayer with Christ and we were dealing with John 15, all right, uh, uh, verse, uh, uh, you know, 7. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, you can ask whatever you wish and it will be done to you. This is the direction of our prayer this morning and I believe that God has spoken to you. Thank you so very much, everyone that has joined us this morning. I hope God will continue. I pray God will continue to give you insight, direction, and a leading. Have yourself a wonderful and a prosperous day. I'll see you again, hopefully tomorrow, maybe as the Lord leads us. Bye-bye.